introduce Dr. Paul Barber, um, a close friend and colleague of all of ours. Um, Paul has told me I have to keep it short and sweet, so I'm not allowed to tell any of the millions of embarrassing stories I have about him. But come and see me later, and I'll be happy to share. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of his academic history. Paul got his undergraduate degree at the University of Arizona uh, in 1991. Uh, he graduated with honors, BS in EEB. Uh, he then went uh, to get his PhD at Berkeley, finished that in 1998, uh, where he wor worked on frogs. And I think we're going to hear a little bit about frogs today. Um, and he worked with uh, the amazing uh, Tyrone Hayes um, and Tony Boronsky. Boronsky, yeah, thank you. Um, he moved on and did an NSF minorities postdoc uh, at Harvard uh, and his advisor was Steve Palumbe. Uh, then he went on to be an assistant professor at uh, Boston University uh, in uh, the biology department. Uh, and he's also in the marine program. Uh, and from 2008, he has joined, the, in, in 2008, he joined the faculty at UCLA and he has been with us ever since. Um, as many of you know, he's going up for step six, uh, full professor step six this year. Um, this is one of the big promotions. Um, so he's going to tell us today about his contributions, his career contributions to science and to society. Thank you, uh, Peggy, for the introduction. Okay, um, so I always begin my talks with uh, acknowledging uh, the many people who have uh, contributed to my career and made this work happen. Um, over, I guess, the last 24 or five years, I've had the privilege of working with really amazing undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs, um, a lot of really tremendous collaborators that have allowed me to do uh, what I do. And I can't put everyone up here, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of the, the people who have contributed uh, to the work that you'll be hearing about today in various ways. Um, this work has been funded by a number of different uh, funding agencies. And last but not least, I wanna thank Jeannie, Naomi, and Nico, my family, because ever since uh, I started on this path as a marine scientist, uh, they have been with me. Um, you know, of all the times I've been to, uh, out in the field with the diversity project, every time but one over the last 18 years, they've been there. So this is not going to be a normal science talk because we are not in normal times. As a graduate student, I was always told, focus on your science. But there's a lot of things going on in the world now that make it a little harder to just justify that, just focus on your science. And so what I'm gonna do today instead is a talk in three acts. I'm gonna talk about you know, what I've been doing uh, over the last, 20 some years as, a, as a, a professional scientist. I'll talk about how we're doing it, but importantly, I'm gonna talk about why and the personal motivations for why I do what I do and why I do it the way I do it. So act one, in science, we talk a lot about significance and probabilities and p-values, you know, less than 0.005. Um, you know, that is significant. And the idea there is that if something happens less than 5% of the time, it's sufficiently rare that it's probably not occurring by random chance. And so we believe that that is significant. I'm a Mexican-American marine scientist and a biologist. In 1997, when I was finishing my PhD, 3.4% of PhDs in biology were conferred to Hispanics, 0.37% of marine science PhDs in 1997 were conferred to Hispanics. And as low as these numbers are, I would actually suggest that the probability of me being here speaking to you today is even lower, not zero, but something pretty close. Not the least of which 
are very strong declarative statements that I made as a graduate student while I was at Berkeley. But it goes deeper than that. So I was born in Tucson, Arizona, and I grew up surrounded by animals. So that probably boosts my probability of becoming a biologist. Um, this is a picture of my mom and me from 1970. So perhaps uh, being a Mexican American with this phenotype, I was destined for a career in genetics because I'm a study in recessive genes. I grew up watching the undersea world of uh, Jacques Cousteau, uh, transfixed by the amazing adventures that he and his crew would have. But to me, this seemed impossible. Uh, one, I grew up in Tucson. Tucson is a desert a long way away from the ocean. The other reason is that I grew up in what I'll call an economically challenged household. So we just simply didn't have the resources to pursue things like this. I went to under-resourced, underserved schools. Uh, this is my middle school, Mansfeld. It's a type of middle school where you could be tapped on the shoulder in the middle of Mr. Peterson's American history class and have a 45 caliber handgun pointed at your head. Um, I know I was a person tapped on the shoulder. I went to a high school underserved and underfunded. Uh, only about 40% of the students I started with completed to graduation. Our high school was more frequented by military recruiters, armor, army, air force, Marines, but not the Navy. Why not? I grew up in a desert, thank you. Um, when I was finishing high school, I was unsure about my goals. Um, I thought that I would give it a go as a, as a professional musician, uh, particularly in symphonic music. But I also really loved fish. Um, and my dream was to go to the University of Washington where I could study music and uh, be part of their fisheries program. I applied, I got accepted, then the economic realities hit. And so I went to my local hometown university, the University of Arizona. At the University of Arizona, um, I studied percussion and ecology and evolutionary biology. I didn't know anything about undergraduate research or opportunities in science. And it was only by random chance, the second semester of my junior year that I took an animal behavior course from Marilyn Houck and a herpetology course from Chuck Lowe. And both of their classes required that we do an undergraduate research project as part of the class. And so being efficient, I decided I would study the behavior of a frog, kill two birds with one stone. And what I was interested in is this canyon tree frog here. It is incredibly cryptic when it is on a piece of granite. But if it's not on a piece of granite, it stands out like a sore thumb. And so how does it know? And so I set up a very, uh, uh, not a very good experiment. Um, but at the end of the uh, semester, both Marilyn and Chuck said the same thing to me. Said, you know what? You should go to grad school and you should go to Berkeley. Uh, and so I did. I went to Berkeley for my PhD. Uh, sorry, Brad, uh, no hard feelings. Um, and I was going to work with Brad. Uh, so, and I went there to study this canyon tree frog. And what I was interested in was that uh, these tree frogs live in these tiny pockets of aquatic habitat that are surrounded by a vast sea of desert. And even these tiny pockets of habitat are in isolated pockets of habitat called sky islands. This is a satellite view where all of these little green spots that you see are these large mountains that rise up from this vast expanse of desert. And so the question in my mind was like, how did all these frogs get here? Because there's no way for them to get there now because they would desiccate, it's just far too far. Um, I spent two years uh, learning to do the genetic methods uh, to try to make this work. And I just, eventually after two years of trying and failing, 
I, I just gave up. There's just, it, it was not working. And um, about that time, uh, I was offered the opportunity to do a project on maternal behavior of spotted hyenas. And in addition to watching Jacques Cousteau, I also grew up watching Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler on Wild Kingdom. And so the idea of spending a couple years in Kenya starting large carnivores seemed quite appealing. And so um, I moved to a tent by myself along the banks of the Talak River where I studied uh, maternal behavior of spotted hyenas and I did uh, radio collaring and tracking of these hyenas. I got to use really cool technology like this uh, a remote control infrared uh, camera that we could drive down hyena burrows to try to see what they were doing. But after a year, it became clear that this project was just a disaster and was gonna go nowhere. And so uh, I left. And as I started my fourth year of graduate school, um, two fellow graduate students of mine, Chris Myers and Alan Collins, um, we wrote a proposal to use genetics to track larval dispersal of marine organisms in Indonesia. Um, and uh, I was going to do clownfish, Chris was going to do cowries, Alan was going to do sponges. Um, but uh, even though we were strongly encouraged and were very hopeful this would get funded, it did not, and so uh, failed yet again. At this point, at the end of my fourth year, my PhD advisor, Anthony Bernowski, left for another institution. So for those of you that may not know, starting your fifth year of graduate school without a lab and without a project is a precarious position. Fortunately, uh, Tyrone Hayes got hired by Berkeley. He brought me into his lab. And in the two years that had passed since I gave up on my original project, the technology's changed and what was impossible before suddenly became possible. And I actually returned to my original pr project and was able to show genetic differentiation highlighted by these different colored circles here across Southern Arizona. But the cool thing is that I was able to show that this differentiation was shaped by a combination of geology and Pleistocene climates where during the Pleistocene, when things were wetter and cooler, these populations were connected by watersheds that we still see reflected in their genetic patterns today. Now, as I was entering November 1997, this paper came out, uh, made a big splash, covered in the New York Times. And this paper by Colm Roberts um, was addressing a very critical question about how to set up networks of marine reserves to be maximally effective. And his idea was relatively simple, which is we can predict where to put marine reserves if we know what the ocean or currents, what the ocean currents are doing and how long larval organisms spend in the water column. And so maybe a butterfly fish like this spends one month in the water column and it only travels so far. But other things like a grouper, maybe they spend two months in the water column. And in that two months, based on the time and the various speeds of the currents, they may travel even further. Now, one of the most fascinating parts of this study to me was the fact that I had a data set that showed it was wrong. See, as I was finishing up my PhD and uh, delaying finishing because I had no postdoc yet, um, I engaged with a small uh, side project with a friend of mine, Mark Erdman, a fellow grad student. Mark had spent his entire career working in the Coral Triangle or his entire graduate career in the Coral Triangle, specifically in Indonesia. Uh, the Coral Triangle is the largest, most biologically diverse marine ecosystem on the planet. And what he was studying in Indonesia were mantis shrimp, these things called stomatopods. And he had just by chance given me some of these to play with. And by chance, I found that 
there are two different genetic types. We'll just call them type one and type two. And what was really surprising about this is that, you know, they have a fairly extensive larval dispersal time, about four weeks. So they should be able to travel quite a distance on ocean currents. And the ocean currents in Indonesia are profound. There is 20 million cubic meters of water per second moving from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. Currents can be in excess of one meter per second. And what I'd like you to see here, I'll highlight for the people on Zoom, is look at this plume of red water going this way. That is the Indonesian through flow. And what's surprising is that these genetic types up here, the black ones, are directly upstream of these white ones. And larval dispersal should disperse them. There should be gene flow, there should be connectivity, and yet there was not. So I wrote an NSF uh, fellowship, uh, which I received and I uh, took at Harvard, uh, working with Steve Columbi. And I started to build on this initial data set and was able to show that populations of this particular mantis shrimp in uh, southern and western Indonesia were very different from central Indonesia and the Philippines. And the reason that we think that this is occurring is that during those Pleistocene glaciations, when glaciers are building up on land and that habitat is changing in Arizona, allowing my frogs to disperse, all of that water that builds up on land comes from the ocean and sea levels drop. And when sea levels drop, what happens is this region, which is mostly ocean now, becomes mostly land. And so you have restricted water movement between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, uh, which we think is one of the, the reasons why we see the genetic patterns that we see. The uh, next thing we did is we expanded the sampling into Eastern Indonesia, and we're surprised to find yet a different genetic type that was out there. And this is when it's important for me to make uh, a confession, which is I have no training in marine science whatsoever. Um, had I had any formal training in marine science, I most certainly would have learned about the Western boundary currents in the Pacific Ocean. And what I'd like to focus your attention on is that spinning mass of red water there. That's called the Halmahera Eddy. The Halmahera Eddy forms in part because the entire Pacific Ocean is being pushed up against Asia. And some of that water can move through the Indonesian archipelago as part of the Indonesian through flow, but there's too much water for all of it to get through. And so a bunch of it gets retroflected back on the North Equatorial countercurrent. And so if the water is not making it from Eastern Indonesia to Central Indonesia, the larvae aren't making it. And so you don't have the gene flow and connectivity that you would, uh, that you would otherwise expect to see. So if I knew anything about physical oceanography, I would have set this up as a hypothesis to test. Um, so based on this work, I was able to get a faculty position at Boston University based uh, at the Marine Biological Labs in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, a, a global mecca for marine science. And at that time, I was really interested in, you know, how did the Coral Triangle become this global epicenter of marine biodiversity? And one of the leading theories was that it's a center of accumulation and that divergence and speciation occurs in the peripheral islands of the Pacific and Indian Ocean. And that diversity accumulates over time in the center, raising local biodiversity levels. But there is another hypothesis called the center of origin, which suggests that diversification happens in the coral triangle. And that diversity is exported into the peripheral coral reefs of the Pacific and Indian Ocean. But this had been largely discounted because people said, you know, most marine organisms have a larval dispersal phase. And because of that, they should disperse a long way on ocean currents. And there are very few barriers to drive diversification. But when you look at the patterns of global biodiversity, with red being high and blue being low, 
what we see is that there's this bullseye right here in that part of Indonesia where I had seen this genetic differentiation in these mantis shrimp. So I thought, you know what, let's do a multi-species test of these regional barriers and see, is this something just unique to this one particular species or is this something that's seen more broadly? But as I started to do this, um, I also thought how crazy it is that I'm like writing this grant in the global mecca of marine science, you know, being a Mexican American kid from the desert, going to underserved schools and studying frogs. That is typically not the way you become a marine scientist. And so I decided that I wanted to try to make sure that it was a little more likely that people with my background might make it into marine science. And so I founded what is known as the Diversity Project, uh, focused on increasing diversity in marine science through the study of marine biodiversity. And it started small with just two students, and it was a very traditional type of uh, undergraduate research experience. And um, we would bring students into the field. Uh, we would, they'd help us collect samples. Uh, we would then uh, train these students in the genetics lab where they would connect, collect our, our DNA sequencing data. And through this method, um, you know, we created a long series of papers uh, looking at a lot of different species where we essentially showed that Western and Southern Indonesian populations were genetically very distinct from those in central Indonesia and the Philippines. Those were different than populations in Eastern Indonesia. And then uh, this one little area here, the Bay of Chandrawasi was different still. And so um, essentially we provided support for the notion of uh, you know, the Coral Triangle being a center of origin. Uh, not that that is the whole story because uh, there are examples of accumulation as well. Act two, as I started learning more about oceanography, uh, I became more interested in being able to model these dispersal uh, questions that, that we're interested in, a skill that I have not. Um, but fortunately, uh, a couple of friends and colleagues, Jonathan Kuhl and Eric Tremel are amazing modelers and that this is what they do. And they do amazing things like they can release virtual larvae into virtual seas and look at virtual dispersal and recruitment informed by lots of different uh, biological characteristics of the organisms that they're modeling. They can do this over and over and over and over hundreds or thousands of generations. They can then create connectivity heat maps where red shows high connectivity and blue shows low connectivity. And what I'd like to highlight is that those same regions that we were just talking about in terms of genetics are highlighted here. There are actually more regions, but the regions that we're talking about are highlighted here. And so it could be that the oceanography itself is driving the diversification. It could be that it's also reinforcing some of these historical processes like lower sea levels. Now, early on in my career at UCLA, I had the good fortune of recruiting uh, Sarah Simmons and Allison Fitzpeniman uh, to my lab. And they became really interested in looking at uh, ecological divergence. And the reason that they were uh, interested in this is that there are these groups of gastropods, uh, snails and nudibranchs, and these gastropods really love coral. Um, they don't just love coral, they love to eat coral. And as larvae, they will settle on a single coral head where it will spend its entire life feeding, reproducing, and dying. And they started collecting these snails and nudibranchs from these areas that we had shown were genetically different, and they found no patterns. And we're scratching our head, it's just like, this doesn't make any sense. These things should be following this pattern. And then they had the, the vision 
to think about, well, wait a second, what about the corals that they're on? And these particular uh, snails and nudibranchs really like to live on corals in the genus Parietes. Um, and there are essentially two groups that I want to point out. There is a cylindrica group that is yellow. There is a lobata group that is green. That is much as I'm going to touch on coral taxonomy because coral taxonomy is a mess. But when you take the genetic information from the snails and the gastropods and you code it, color code it by the, the coral host it came off of, what you see is that the snails that come off of lobata type corals are different than the ones that come off of cylindrica type corals. This is true both in the snails and in the nudibranchs, and it's true whether you're looking at mitochondrial DNA or um, doing genome-wide SNP surveys with thousands and thousands of loci. So what this is showing is that even within the coral triangle, we don't have to invoke physical oceanography or Pleistocene uh, sea level changes. Ecological speciation can be occurring in this region because of these very close associations between organisms and the environment that they live in. Act three. STEM is a lot, diff lot less diverse than the US demographics. Uh, it's about a third of what you ex expect at random based on US demographics. And one of the reasons for this uh, is that if you look at the percentage of students who start in a STEM degree that finish in a STEM degree, what you see is that uh, Latinx and Black students nationwide finish their STEM degrees at a much lower rate than white students. Uh, this is true at UCLA as well. In this case, we're looking at white and Asian students and underrepresented minorities. Um, and this difference in completion rate is often referred to as a persistence gap. And one of the things that I've heard throughout my career about this persistence gap is people deflecting blame, saying, you know what? Our K through 12 system is broken. They need to fix the K through 12 system if this problem's going to change. Um, they will say things like, there's nothing I can do. It's like, Everything was set in motion before they came into my classroom. I came to UCLA to direct this program here, uh, the Program for Excellence in Education and Research in the Sciences. I call it PEERS because that's a mouthful. Um, and PEERS serves what people would refer to as at-risk students, students that are unlikely to complete their STEM majors. Uh, you know, it's 90% students from underrepresented minority groups, 65% first generation college students. The majority are from low socioeconomic status homes. Uh, the majority come from low performing high schools uh, throughout California. So what is peers and how does it work? So it's a cohort based program with about 200 students per cohort. Um, it's for first and second year STEM majors and our students take two seminars, one focused on academic survival skills, one focused on career development. Uh, we have dedicated academic counselors to advise them throughout their academic journey. We have collaborative learning workshops that go along with the core science courses that they take. Um, and we invite two faculty each quarter to talk about their research to our students. The one thing that peers is not, it is not remedial. There's no remedial programming in this whatsoever. What peers is, however, is a controlled study so that we can see whether our modest interventions actually make a difference. And so we compare peer students to a match control group that's matched for a lot of different uh, demographic characteristics like gender, ethnicity, uh, you know, high school GPA, SAT scores, things like that. And what you do when you, what you see when you compare peer students to the control group is that they earn higher grades in their course STEM courses. So if you take LS30, an introductory bath course for, for biology, biology majors, peer students have higher grades. 
in uh, introductory calculus, higher grades, introductory chemistry, higher grades, uh, the uh, other introductory chemistry, higher grades. And because they're, inter they're getting higher grades in these introductory chemistry, it, math, biology, chemistry classes, they end up with a higher overall GPA at the end of their second year. Well, when you're succeeding at something, you stick with it. And so what happens is that if you compare the persistence in STEM majors of peers to the control, they persist at a significantly higher rate, despite coming from at-risk backgrounds. Um, and in fact, peer students complete STEM degrees at the highest rate of any group of students on campus. So um, not only that, they're twice as likely to engage in undergraduate research. They're six times more likely to get scholarships for engaging in research. They're twice as likely to go to med school. They're seven times as likely to go to grad school. So yeah, there are problems with our K through 12 system, but these don't have to be a barrier to success. These are barriers to success because we perceive them to be barriers rather than something that can actually quite easily be overcome. Now, as much as I'm interested in STEM diversity as a whole, I'm very, very interested in diversity in marine science. 4% uh, of the marine science workforce comes from underrepresented groups. This uh, is in part because of historical barriers of exclusion where uh, people of color were not allowed to go to swimming pools. Uh, they were beaten by uh, police and other people if they tried to go to public beaches. Um, but there's also not just an exclusion problem, there's an exposure problem. If you look at the demographics of California as a whole compared to a coastal community like La Jolla, you see a very different picture. And because those coastal communities are far less diverse, there are far fewer people being exposed to those marine environments and being inspired to look at marine science as a potential future. And so the diversity project was developed to deal with that exposure problem. And it was designed to be a transformative international research experience uh, that will diversify science uh, through the study of marine biodiversity. We start by teaching students to be, uh, we train them as, as scuba divers uh, at UCLA. And then we take them to amazing places like Indonesia or French Polynesia here. And then we train them to use scuba as a research tool. And we certify them as uh, scientific research divers. And they get to see and experience the amazing, vibrant uh, ecosystems that are South Pacific coral reefs. And they learn how to use scuba for research, but then we have them go to basic principles and you know, do science from the ground up, observe your environment. What do you see that's different? Why do you think that might be? Develop a a project to test that hypothesis. And we have our students develop their own projects and it works uh, really, really well. So, uh, you know, we started small in 2005 with two students. Now we have uh, typically nine or 10 students a year, plus another three or four graduate students uh, as mentors and postdocs. Um, most of our alumni are women, most are black or Latinx. And I could tell you about, um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the impact of, of the program. 71% uh, of our alumni matriculate to graduate school. 14 have gotten their PhDs at uh, you know, places like Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, Scripps, UCSB, UC Davis, um, UC Santa Cruz. 22 are currently enrolled in PhD programs. Three have received uh, Fulbright fellowships. 13 have received the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. 11 have received UC HBCU fellowships. Three are now tenure track faculty and two serve on the board of the Association for the Study of Limnology and Oceanography. And I would love to tell you about every one of our alumni, but we don't have enough time. So, you know, I just wanna show you some of the people who 
uh, have come out of this program and where they went to school. And to show you that, that we are quite literally changing the face of marine science. And I've often been asked like, you know, what makes it work? Like why, like, why do so many people go on to graduate school? And yeah, I think part of it is that it's exciting. It's international. Uh, so, you know, here there is a, a Kechak dance in Indonesia. Um, it's always been field-based and the field teaches itself. Um, it's easy to be excited about being in the field. Um, it's always been a family project. So since 2005, uh, Jeannie, Naomi, and Nico have not gone with us on the diversity project twice. Uh, the same thing is true uh, with Peggy and Caitlin and John. Um, I think it was the one Indonesia year where they didn't uh, come. And so, you know, the families are always integrated. So you don't have to sacrifice family for science. Um, and we make it fun. We do things like we go to the beach, we teach them how to surf. We make it an experience that they never want to have end. And that's the idea is that if they don't want it to end, they'll keep going. And this is how, you know, we were doing this, you know, pretty much on autopilot until 2013, when after 15 years of getting research permits, uh, suddenly my research permits were denied. And this happened a week before we were supposed to leave. The students were already at UCLA. And so fortunately, Peggy and Caitlin stepped up and they said, you know what, let's go to Maria. We'll do this like what we do in the marine biology quarter. And what we saw is dramatic shifts in outcomes. And in all of these graphs, the blue is pre-2013, the post is, or the, the red is post-2013. Desire to pursue a career in science increases. Pursue graduate school, increases. Pursue a career in academic, almost double. Uh, desire to pursue a career in marine science, again, almost double. Um, increasing enrollment in graduate programs, but specifically increasing enrollment in PhD programs. And a lot of those students who, are, who got, got master's degrees they're actually doing it with the intention of going on to a PhD. And so what we saw is this tremendous change in outcomes pre and post 2013. And so uh, what makes the difference? And Peggy and I now have an NSF grant to actually answer that question. Um, we have some ideas. Uh, one is that you know, we formalized dive training as part of the program. And so everyone gets trained as a scientific diver even the students who entered our program not knowing how to swim. We have alumni come back and uh, mentor the new cohort of students so that the new students can see a path forward and they can see how to navigate that path. Um, as I mentioned before, we've grown in size. So wherever we go, immediately becomes the most diverse marine lab in this country. And so our students always feel like they belong. Um, but the other thing we've done is we've invited their families to participate as well. In fact, we fund their families to come to the final symposium. And not only do they go to the final symposium, but they come to the California Science Center where they get to watch their children dive in the giant kelp tank exhibit. And I can't tell you the impact on a parent to hear their kids talk about this amazing research they did over the summer and see someone who didn't know how to swim scuba diving in a big uh, museum exhibit like this. So what we've created something is quite different from a traditional REU that's based on the PI's research. Students are assigned projects that may or may not align with their interests. You know, in this model that we're doing, you know, we mentor students to develop their own projects. Um, those projects, because they develop them align with their interests. And this develops the student's identity as a scientist. And rather than me tell you about this, I'm gonna let the students speak for themselves. On top of being able to conduct our own projects in a different country, we got to learn about graduate school and look at their uh, universities, look around, talk to the mentors and the graduate students 
we definitely talked to the graduate students and it really helped me when it came to um, thinking about graduate school and where I wanted to go. I'm definitely more confident in just conducting research and diving and swimming. Learn how to scientifically scuba dive. That was really helpful in our projects. I learned how to work well with others. In the field of marine science, it's not a lot of black men. This experience, I need to go back into my university to tell them. I met so many different people. I met a whole bunch of different professors. I'm gonna start crying. Don't cry. Uh, it was just really um, amazing. Basically, the diversity project pushed me, like, and it showed me that I, I'm capable of going off to graduate school. I felt like this whole summer we got to see the entire life cycle of what it's like from like designing a project to being out in the field to coming back and analyzing to presenting it. And so the best part was just finally understanding what that lifestyle is like. So not only knowing what it's like to go out and collect the data, but also what it's like to have a dinner party with other scientists and learn about their research and to be able to step back and really evaluate, is this something that I could see myself doing? And I think actually most of us really found that it was something that we were passionate about and we could see ourselves doing this every day for a long time. Usually you're working under other people with what the projects that they're doing. And the difference here in the, the diversity project is that you actually have the freedom to, to do what you want. Before the program started, like the days were getting closer, I was like, Oh my God, like, this is really cool, but I'm kind of getting scared because I don't know what to ask. I could say that I feel different now that we came back. I, I feel like empowered. I feel like I could state a question and actually go through it and feel like my brain was open. Like, like you could do this. Like, why are you always putting this thoughts of, no, nah, you're not good enough, or you, you can't do it. And it was shown through me to the program that I'm able to do what I want to do. I'm like, oh, I'm ready to just continue and, and, uh, and learn new things. Just having the support system and being able to know that, you know, you can do it, you can get through it, you can do the research, and knowing that there are all these people really cheering you on. It challenged me to do new things or do things that I didn't think that I could before. Like I'd say throughout the program, you definitely accumulate more confidence in yourself. They guided us along the way, but it was really good for someone to have the confidence in you to pull all that off. And now we have the opportunity to get our work published. I learned a lot about myself and about science. It was a good experience. So this was all one cohort. So um, a step six talk is supposed to be a sort of a career review and, and I wanna finish with a few lessons learned. I think it's important to understand the power that our words have. I would not be here today, I don't know what happened to that image, um, without Marilyn and Chuck encouraging me to go to graduate school. And what I didn't tell you about the story is that I've had subsequent conversations with Marilyn. She has no recollection of ever saying this to me. And think about how many times we say things to students, how many times we engage, and how many opportunities we may have had to put someone on a different trajectory just by the power of our words. I think it's important that we advocate for others. I told you about me joining Tyrone's lab in my fifth year at his student in grad school. What I neglected to tell you is that I initially wasn't gonna be admitted to Berkeley. And it was a graduate student by the name of Tyrone Hayes that was a graduate student rep on the admissions committee that spoke up and advocated on my behalf and said, how can we not take this person into our program at Berkeley. Had he not done that, we would not be having this conversation today. I think it's important that we become better at taking chances on people and giving them, uh, you know, just give people a chance. And, you know, Tony took a chance on me as a uh, incoming graduate student. But what I neglected to tell you is that when I applied to graduate school, I was dead set on genetics. Tony, for people who know him, is a paleontologist. How many paleontologists are gonna take a geneticist into their lab? 
How many people, you know, are willing to take that kind of a chance? Um, and had Tony not taken a chance on me, we would not be having this conversation today. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, if Tony, I can't see if you're there or not, but if you did, I, I hope you see your fingerprints all over the work that I did because of uh, the influence that you had on me when I was in your lab. Lastly, I think it's important to be intentional in creating opportunities for people who haven't always had them. There is so much untapped potential out there that is currently not being included in the STEM enterprise. And I think we need to do much better at creating those opportunities for these individuals and tapping into that tremendous potential that's there. And in order to do that, we need to stop thinking about these barriers and stop thinking about why we can't do all these things and why we can't change things. And, you know, once we can realize that most of those barriers are actually only barriers in our mind, and only when we begin to believe it's possible, only then will things finally change. Thank you. I'm so sad to help. <clears throat> Questions? Yes, John. Uh, I think that uh, in the success of the program, uh, what were the reasons that it was able to get the that they did? And then second, they reversed themselves and were really strategic in doing that. Um, so uh, the, the, the permit wasn't to do the diversity project. The, there's a lot of sensitivities about genomic and genetic resources in developing countries like Indonesia. And so because there's a genetic component to almost everything we do, they've really clamped down recently and it's just, it's made it uh, unviable um, to, to really consider doing it. Um, but I, I think, you know, do it, what's, what's so amazing about working in Morea is that we actually have the flexibility to have, you know, have permits that allow students to develop their own projects. That's something that's currently not, would not be allowed under the Indonesian permit system. So I think it'd be hard to consider returning back to Indonesia. Um, as much as I love Indonesia, as much as I would love to be able to, to, to work there again. Other questions? Just holding on that. So Uh, so yeah, I think we could. I think we could do the same thing here. Um, I, I think in terms of uh, you know the diving side of things, it's a little more challenging working in colder water with lower visibility. So I think that it would require probably a little higher level of of water skill before starting. Um, but I think you know the permits would be a problem. Um, but the other thing is that it's actually not cheaper to be in California. Our most expensive parts of the program are when we're here. Um, it's cheaper for us to be in Morea, uh, both for food and lodging. And, um, you know, if we did it all here, it would actually cost us more. Yeah, so, um, you know, there, there are, 
there are opportunities for international students. They're unfortunately a little rarer, particularly when you're dealing with funding agencies like NSF, where, um, you know, we used to, uh, one of the big motivations of working in Indonesia, and I didn't get to talk about it, is that in parallel with the diversity project, we had a big program where we brought in students from all over Indonesia to work with our students. Um, and, uh, you know, that's because, you know, we could pay for things when we were in Indonesia, but we couldn't pay for people to come here. Um, we're hoping over time that we have more funding that gives us that flexibility to be able to support the, um, you know, the ambitions and dreams of, of international students as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, we may have that possibility now where we, we're still exploring it, but, um, you know, you can send me an email and I can try to connect you with people. Oh, question in the chat. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so a question from Noah. Um, how do the sail, snails and gastropods segregate by coral type? Um, so uh, very good question. So what happens is uh, when these snails and nudibranchs are larvae, uh, a lot of recruitment cues are based on smell. And so the, uh, the larvae are essentially smelling the water, for lack of a better term, um, to see which corals that they should go on. But what happens is that, you know, sometimes, you know, you may be driving down the road and maybe you've got your heart set on in and out, um, but, you know, eventually you just got to eat. You got to stop somewhere. And so um, there comes a time where the larvae is either going to recruit onto a coral or it's going to die. But when it recruits onto a coral and it happens to be the wrong coral, the cue of what its offspring are going to, um, the, the cue that the offspring will pick up on and that they will be smelling for in the future is based on the coral that they were spawned on. And so what happens, it's, it's sort of like salmon. If the salmon goes up the wrong stream, you know, successfully breeds and lays eggs, those larvae, larval salmon imprint on that stream and eventually they just keep going back to that stream based on the mistakes of their parents. Um, and so the same thing happens with these, uh, these uh, snails and nudibranchs. So just a, a quick question on the model. Um, so, uh, it's been a while since I've done, since I've collaborated with, with Eric and Jonathan. Um, but, uh, that is something that they are interested in because one of the predictions of, of climate change is, is that, um, some of this water movement will slow down. Um, and that's one of these like kind of double whammy things because, the reason why we know so much about ocean currents in Southeast Asia is because it's the one of the controls of global climate is the transfer of heat energy from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean through the Indonesian through flow. And so, um, you know, people know about the out of Africa hypothesis and, you know, 40,000 years ago, you know, or, or so, you know, humans started to leave Africa. Well, one of the reasons that we believe that that happened was because of a massive drought and that massive drought coincided with the slowing down of the Indonesian through flow and the movement of heat energy from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. So um, I'm sure this is something that, that, they, that they are thinking about, um, but I don't know the specifics beyond that. And you have a... Yeah, I think that host associated Exactly. Yep. The, the question that we always have that's hard to discern is 
did they evolve as associations allopatrically and then come together, or was it a range of connections, or was it like St. Patrick post association conversion? Like, is your group been able to kind of disentangle a little bit of that to see if it's actually a mechanism of adaptive radiation? Yeah, so um, that that is a really good question, and it's something that uh, I wish we would be able to answer. One of the challenges is that all of this work was being completed as Indonesia became uh, too challenging to continue working there. And so, uh, you know, they had played around with some, uh, some small experiments to look at, uh, you know, survival on the, you know, if you switch hosts and things like that, um, what, what happens. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, the, I guess the, the only thing I would say is that, you know, I think it's probably more likely to have occurred um, in sympatry just because of the lack of, of other sorts of, you know, even if you look just in, within just the Lobata group of snails or nudibranchs or just the cylindrical ones, and you try to look at geographic partitioning there, you don't see geographic partitioning. And so, you know, it's hard to envision how you would have had a lot of geographic partitioning in order to differentiate and then come back together. And yet they, now they just move everywhere and it doesn't matter. And so I think anecdotally, but to be able to prove it, I mean, you know, even in insect world, when you can control things pretty, it's, it's a hard thing to prove. Okay, hey, help me thank Paul again. Thank you.